Here we go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar today, which is Data Warehouse or Data Lake. Which do I choose? Sponsored today by Ahana. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And to find the Q&A in the chat panels, you can click those icons down in the bottom middle of your screen to activate those features. And just to note, Zoom defaults the chat to section to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change it to chat with everyone. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Ali LeClerc. Ali has over a decade of experience in open source software product and community marketing. She's currently the head of community at AHANA, the as software as a service for Presto Company, where she works closely with the Presto Foundation to drive open source programs. Prior to AHANA, Ali held community and marketing positions at Alexio, Cashbase, and Time Warner. She holds a degree from Yale University in political science. And with that, I will give the floor to Ali to get the webinar started. Hello and welcome welcome. Thank you, Shannon, for quite a nice introduction and welcome. Thanks everybody for joining. Looking forward to talking more about data warehouses or data lakes. Which do I choose? So why don't we jump into what we'll actually be talking about today? Um, so I'm going to start with just a quick introduction. What is data warehouse? What is a data lake? And then I'm going to touch on the data lake house. Maybe it's a term that uh, you have heard about lately. I think in the last six to eight months, the data lake house has certainly been picking up quite an amount of buzz. So I'll be talking more about that. And then I'm going to talk about Presto for the data lake house and do a quick intro on what Presto is and, and why we think Presto is the best SQL engine for that data lake house. I'll touch on some real world use cases. And then I have some time for Q&A at the end. So. With that, let's get started. So let's start the traditional data warehouse. Um, typically, it was a columnar structure. Uh, if we look back, you know, to the traditional data warehouse days, it had an in database analytics, very performance focused, um, and really it was it was built for structured data. And what that really meant was that data had to be modeled. And data modeling was somewhat of an endless task. You had to ETL that data, you had to extract all that data from all of your sources, and you had to transform it, then you had to load it back into the data warehouse. And then finally, it was all primarily accessed through SQL. So data warehouses were made up of you know, a few different sources, a few different out, um, outputs. But for the most part, if you look at the challenges, which I have here, they were, and they still kind of are, they're expensive, um, very expensive, actually. They can be a little bit slower. They can be difficult to manage and very expensive to maintain. Um, and they do provide access to just a limited amount of data. So a lot of challenges, yes, a lot of benefits, but, but a lot of challenges as well. So let's look at the data lake. Um, if we move to the data lake and take a look at, at just the data lake in and of itself, um, and let, let me just take a step back. We all remember Hadoop, right? Hadoop was gonna replace the data warehouse. You know, Years ago, everyone was reading that the warehouse was dead and Hadoop was taking over the world. Um, and, and just a quick primer on Hadoop. So Hadoop was a file system, data storage. It was really inexpensive to use. And loading data into that Hadoop data lake was really cheap. And you could store all types of data, structured, semi-structured, unstructured. And it was all about ingesting data, loading it in and, and creating the structure once you had all of that data in there. And you could keep all of your data in there. And one of the big things that Hadoop helped was um, was with that separation of storage and compute. So really for the first time, it, it's, it separated out those two layers where you had storage with HDFS and then compute went through many iterations and generations, even in that Hadoop timeframe. So it started with MapReduce and then it was Hive, but, but the point here was that you separated those, those, two, um, those two tiers out and you can do a lot more compute on, on your storage. So primary use cases um, for the data lake, discovery, text analytics, data science, uh, mostly notebook and Python and other languages, but uh, became the primary way to, to access, although there was some SQL access as well. So 
While the data lake was, was less expensive, certainly than, than the data warehouse, there was limited performance, especially when it came to complex analytics. There was limited SQL access. And in general, the data lake was kind of hard to govern. Um, Hadoop didn't really have those enterprise capabilities at first. And I think you know, one of the, the biggest challenges with Hadoop was that it was really hard to use. It was never really simplified. Um, and you know, technology, it, it could be really great, um, but if it's complicated and it takes too long to get value from, then it, then it doesn't really serve its purpose. And over time, a lot of people struggled with it. So what were the drivers behind the modernization of the data warehouse and data lake? Um, let me start by saying that cloud is probably one of the biggest drivers of this, and I'll cover that in, in more detail later on. Um, but what we've seen since the inception of the data warehouse and the rise in the data lake with the advent of Hadoop, there's been this really rapid modernization of those three of those uh, platforms, and it's driven by three things. So the first is digital transformation. Everything's moved to digital now. There's massive upticks of things like mobile technology. There's more interactive web and mobile apps, um, and those are way more engaging. And there's tons of new data and data types. And along with that is an uptick in engagement. So think about engagement with your employees, with your customers, with your partners, etc. Second is real-time events. Everything's moving closer to real-time, and that's created a need to respond quickly to business events of any kind. Third is, is really being on the cusp of seeing everything automated. So in the world of robotics, for example, there are these like massive plants where everything's being automated. And in order to automate everything, that requires incredible intelligence delivered to machines, to sensors, and to all kinds of devices in, uh, in the IoT in order to automate everything. So, so smart data has, has really been a driver um, to modernize. So if we look at the data warehouse versus the data lake, these trends have really pushed us to the modernization of, of both of them. If you look at this slide, modern, uh, modernization is happening in both places, but in all areas. So the most modern of both is, is cloud first, which I alluded to earlier. And there are increasingly more companies who are moving to the cloud, and there are increasingly more companies that are born in the cloud. And I call these digital native businesses. Their entire infrastructure is in the cloud. It could be one cloud, it could be multiple clouds. And then going on one step deeper on the on cloud first, today we're seeing a lot of containerization. So Kubernetes, I'm sure many of you are, are part of it, you may even be using it, super popular, very stable, and a lot of companies are leveraging containers like Kubernetes to run their business. And even at Ahana, where I work today, we were born in the cloud. We built Ahana as cloud first, and we built completely on, on Kubernetes and containerize it to take advantage of, of all the flexibility you get with that in the cloud and the availability of the cloud and the scalability of the cloud. Um, and so moving to the next bullet here, there's a move to more in-memory capabilities. And on the data warehouse side, um, they're now bringing in more complex data types than ever before. And, and the modern data lake is now bringing in columnar data types. So I talked earlier about um, the separation of compute and storage, and we're seeing that more so now. Um, and so I won't go through every single one of these bullets in detail, but it kind of gives you a good sense of, of where we're at today when it comes to looking at um, the data warehouse and the data lake. I will touch on open formats um, as well. So formats like Apache ORC, Apache Parquet, um, specifically within the data lake, they can be consumed by, by many different engines. So what's really important about open formats is that you're not locked into one specific technology and you can move from one engine to another. For example, Spark supports it or Presto supports it and TensorFlow uh, just added support for it. So with the data lake, you can leverage open formats, which are highly performant and have multiple types of processing on top of it. And of course, the data warehouses are trying to expand and extend themselves um, to the data lake. But what happens is when you have a critical path for any product, it's built for a specific type of data. So with data warehouses, it's proprietary formats. Um, cloud formats like S3, there might be an extension. With data lakes, they're built for the open formats and not for these proprietary formats. So these are some of the considerations to think about as you're looking between the data warehouse and the data lake. How open do you want it to be? Um, you know, is, is cost a factor? 
Uh, you know, we have the adoption of, of AWS Amazon S3, which is one of the most popular uh, data lakes today. Um, tons of companies, tons of, of data getting moved to S3. And the, with the advent of, of this simple, very cheap commoditized storage, um, S3 is becoming a, a big driver in the use of the data lake and moving to the cloud. So combining the both of both of both worlds, let's talk about, I, I, I talked about the data lake house, but what does it mean to really merge the data warehouse and the data lake and the workloads? How does that work and, and what does that even mean? And so, um, you know, we've talked about the, the data warehouse, we've talked about the data lake, the differences between the two, but let's talk about what's going on today in the market. And, and um, we're at a point where these two things are, are converging. And I'll talk in a lot more detail on the, on the data lake house stack and the architecture later on. But first, let's talk about why we're seeing this trend and specifically how a distributed um, query engine like Presto is helping drive this. So which one do you want to bet on in the future? Where is your primary path that you want to optimize for? And the reason this is important is because it's going to tell you where your data is going to live. Is 80% of your data in the warehouse or is it in the lake? And that's an important decision. And it's driven by the business requirements you have. So what we're seeing is if you have some dashboards or some reports and you need really high performance access and the data warehouse is a good fit, but there's an emerging trend of a different kind of analysis and consolidating that into a lake it gives you the ability to, to run these future-proof technologies on a lake. And there's so much innovation happening on the lake today, so that, so that becomes a fundamental decision. The next path, path, even if you choose one way or the other, the good part is that you do have a layer on top and that you can abstract that and give you access to both, and that's with SQL access, so querying across multiple data sources. At Ahana, we see most people, most of our customers, leveraging the data lake and then they query maybe one or two other data sources. So let's look at the list I have here. So first is SQL access, which is important. Most companies have data teams that know SQL, that can run SQL queries, and that can use SQL to access data. So leveraging those resources to get better insight into your data lake, um, into, your, into your data lake and your data warehouse, that's bringing the, the best of both here. Then you have unified analytics. Um, which means you can support more of your business use cases with a distributed query engine. Distributed query engines mean you can leverage your existing platforms and your data sources with limitless scale for all data types, which is incredibly powerful. So our hypothesis is that the next enterprise data warehouse is the open data lake house. This convergence of the data warehouse and the data lake, what does it actually look like? So if we look at the last few decades, if you wanted to do SQL processing at a fairly large scale, you'd probably be using the enterprise data warehouse, which makes sense. It was purpose built for SQL because it's widely adopted um, and it's a great language for interacting with the abstractions you have, which are things like tables and doing things like reports or dashboards. So some of those characteristics, usually it's very coupled. So you have your storage, which you see here, your proprietary storage. Um, and this is usually in some sort of proprietary format that the vendor stores your data in. And it would have um, a highly optimized engine on top of that. Um, and that give, gives you the ability to interpret that data in that format. And typically you get really good performance in the data warehouse, though it can get really expensive. So this is where we see a lot of companies start to have challenges with their enterprise data warehouse. The cost or price performance starts getting really high as they're using more compute resources for their data. Plus it's a really locked in type of system. Data formats are proprietary. So now to address those things, we're seeing what we call the open data lake house gaining a lot of steam. The stack has been separated out. So the storage is no longer coupled to the compute and it's scalable. So you can leverage the cloud and be elastically scalable and it's pretty low cost, relatively low cost. So the amount you're paying for the storage is very cheap compared to the data warehouse. And now that your storage is no longer tied to a compute engine, you can leverage many different types of compute. Um, and by the way, that storage can be anything, text, images, videos, files, many different formats. So um, those engines, different engines can read it. So you, then you have your engines on top, you can run your, your ML and your AI workloads. Um, then you can have Presto, which we'll spend some time talking about 
uh, Presto allows you to access the data in your data lake like S3, S3, expose it with a SQL interface so you can work with that data as if you were working with tables in a data warehouse and you could like, uh, like select star from some table and it'll access the data in S3 data lake and then return the results in a table. And that's how you get your reporting and your dashboarding etc so um, you know you have your reporting and dashboarding on top of that and then you have your data science your ml and your ai on top of your ml and ai frameworks and then last you have your governance um, your discovery your quality your security technologies those are technologies like apache hoodie iceberg delta lake etc amundsen um, they give you more parity with the data warehouse and i won't go into a ton of detail into this but i wanted to, to show kind of the whole picture here on how we're looking at the open data lake house and really like i mentioned earlier the reason we're seeing this shift to the open data lake house is to solve for those two key challenges with the enterprise data warehouse cost and flexibility price performance is typically much better on the open data lake house and you have a lot more flexibility with open formats uh, open data formats open technologies open source open clouds and the like so Considerations for choosing a data warehouse or data lake. I'm guessing or hoping many of you joined today to learn um, to learn more about what you should be thinking about as you're making some architectural decisions around unified analytics or or choosing a data warehouse or data lake. Um, so what we put together are just some considerations to think about as part of that process. And there are eight areas to drill into, and I won't go really deep into each of these, but I hope they help kind of frame, um, frame it for you. So starting with data, what kinds of data do you need to support? Can your approach support the breadth of that data, structured, complex data types, textual, streaming? Analytics, you wanna be able to support a broad range of analytics, not just SQL, but Python, notebook, search. So you wanna plan for the future, set yourself up, uh, with a solution that can support a broad range of analytics, not just what you need today, but what you might need in the future. Users, does your, does your solution support a broad set, a set of users on a single platform? Can your data engineer, your data analyst, your data scientist, your line of business owner, can they all access the data um, that they need to do their, their daily tasks, their daily jobs? What does your platform support? Um, is cloud critical? Does it support your enterprise re uh, requirements? Is it cost efficient? Drilling more into cloud. Um, is it elastic? Is it automated? Uh, can you scale it? Is there mobility? Is there globality? What can you do as you expand it into new regions? Does your platform support that? Drilling into the enterprise, security, privacy, governance, unification, a lot of enterprise uh, requirements, will your platform support those things? Business, looking at business, does it support business semantics and the logic I want to include in that? Will, uh, will it allow me to create measurable value for my organization and optimize? Can you create more value over time? And finally, cost. Will you be able to forecast your costs accurately over time? What is the cost at scale? As it grows, anyone that's doing analytics um, and as anyone that's doing analytics or will your analytics be growing over time? Will you be able to scale as your business grows without having to break the bank? So I think what's important to note here is that when it comes to costs, the way data platform, data platform teams today are evaluating technologies is, is really changing. And at HANA, what we're seeing is a lot more people wanting to start pay as you go so that you only pay for what you use as you decide what technologies to leverage. So it's usually in a consumption model. And our recommendation, my recommendation is make sure you have that option because it gives you the flexibility to try things out and you don't have to have that exorbitant cost to, to, to try it out. Um, and the cloud is allowing you, know, allowing you to do that. It's definitely an enabler of this model. All right, so a little bit more about us. Why am I here today talking about data warehouse or data lake and where does Ahana and, and Presto fit in? And so. Let's start first with, with open source Presto. I don't know how many folks have heard about Presto. Let me do a quick introduction here. So Presto is an open source project. It's a distributed SQL query engine for the data lake and the lake house, um, which you saw in the data lake house architecture slide. And it was built for fast 
analytic queries against data of any size. Um, the project came out of, of Meta, Facebook, back in 2013. And today it's being used at scale at internet giants like Uber and Twitter and TikTok, ByteDance, in addition to Meta. And you can query data in place so you don't need to move or ETL data. It supports federated querying so you can join data from different, um, from different source formats. So super high level, that's, that's why Presto is so awesome. Uh, today, Presto is governed by the Linux Foundation, so it's an open, neutral, open source project. And there's a lot of companies. I named a bunch of the bigger companies, um, but big and small that are leveraging Presto. So I won't go into a ton of technical detail today on, on what Presto is, but if you are interested in, in going deeper, there are um, a ton of resources available on ahana.io that will take you more in depth into the architecture, um, et cetera, if you want to go deeper in, into that. But I will go into some of the more popular use cases and how we see customers using Presto for the data lake and the data lake house today. So starting with interactive ad hoc querying, uh, right in Presto sweet spot, you can run interactive queries on your data as you need to, and that's all in your data lake. There's a ton of reporting and dashboarding, which should be no surprise given what we've been talking about today. Um, so more of like kind of the traditional data warehouse workloads. But we also see federation across different sources or different data lakes. Um, and some of these applications are powering customer facing applications. So taking advantage of, um, of the power of, of SQL in that sort of way is, is becoming more popular. And then uh, more advanced functionality, the data lake house can provide with data lake house analytics and transformation using SQL. So high level, these are these are kind of the five key use cases that we see across our, our customers and the and the Presto um, user community. And let's talk about Ahana. So what do we do? So our mission um, at Ahana is to simplify the use of, of Presto and make it accessible and usable for data platform teams of all sizes. Um, as Shannon mentioned in the introduction, we are the SaaS for Presto company. So what we've done is we've built it to be fully integrated and cloud native. It gives you the best of both worlds. You have full visibility into your clusters, into your nodes. You don't have to worry about installing and configuring um, anything. So given the vast potential um, that the open data lake house provides, there's still a lot of challenges in standing up that kind of environment. And really what we do at Ahana is we want to create the easiest managed service for Presto. We want to enable you to do your SQL compute on top of your data lake, uh, reporting and dashboarding, your lake house type of applications, and supporting data teams of all sizes. So it's free to get started. It's just pay as you go. It's all in the AWS marketplace. It's a really easy way to get started with Presto on your data lake or for your data lake house. Um, as you begin your journey um, from, to the data lake and to the data lake house. So let's talk about some real world use cases. Starting with Blinkit. So for folks who aren't familiar, Blinkit is one of India's top instant delivery services. Um, their motto is everything delivered in 10 minutes. So one of the challenges Blinkit had prior to moving to Ahana um, was they were in a, in a data warehouse, a cloud data warehouse, and their price performance, specifically the costs, were just starting to get unmanageable. Um, they are, they kind of, they grew very, ex very fast um, exponentially. The amount of data that they were processing, the amount of compute resources they needed, um, it, it just, it grew significantly over a short period of time. And so what they found was their price performance, they just, it wasn't making sense for what they needed. So what they did is they moved from their, their, their data warehouse to the open data lake house approach. Um, and use Ahana Cloud for Presto at the core. So Presto as the SQL query engine on top of S3. Um, and today they use this architecture to power over 200,000 orders per day at a much, much better price performance. And uh, we actually did a, a customer presentation with them a few weeks ago at the AWS Startup Showcase. Um, really great video, check it out if you're interested in learning more about their architecture and why they chose the, the data lake house approach and specifically Presto um, to power the, the SQL 
um, queries for, for that data lake house. But one of the things they said is that Ahana is providing Blinkit with the SaaS managed service for Presto and giving the company the advanced data management capabilities it needs to meet its instant delivery promise. So fantastic use case here on a company facing challenges, facing limits with their data warehouse in the cloud and moving to a more open architecture, open data lake house approach. And then next is Securonix. Um, so Securonix is a security information and event management software company. Um, they use Ahana for their in-app SQL analytics. So what that what they call it is threat hunting. And every single day they'll get millions of potential threats uh, events to stream in. They'll stream it into um, their S3 data lake. And on top of S3, they want to be able to run quick queries to see where potential threats may be lurking. And that's why they chose Ahana for Presto. For those billions of events that get stored in S3, um, they, again, similar to Blinkit, were facing very significant challenges when it came to price performance with their data um, cloud data warehouse. Moving to this approach, they saw 3x better price performance um, with Ahana for Presto on AWS. So, just a few um, use cases there, some validation on, on you know, the challenges folks are facing, real customers are facing in the cloud with their data warehouses and why they're moving to this more open approach, um, open architecture, open data lake house. So with that, um, I know we have plenty of time for questions and it looks like there's quite a few here. So Shannon and I will turn it over to you to see um what we the questions thank you so much uh yes lots of questions and just to answer the most commonly asked questions just a note i will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording so diving in here uh so ali from uh, an environmental social and governance perspective focusing on the environmental um, aspect as specifically, can you provide any insight on the impact of the data warehouse versus that of the data lake with regard to energy consumption and carbon footprint? Uh, so I don't have any metrics or statistics top of top of hand here. Um, and you know, I've never really gotten this question. So Indra, I'm sorry, I don't have very good a good answer for you, but let me take that and follow up with my engineering team to see if we can get you something that uh, I just want to make something up out here. So I'll take we'll take that and we'll follow up directly with you. Sounds good. I love it. It's an interesting question. So um, can we have star a star schema data warehouse inside the inside the data lake? If not, what's the reason for that? Yeah, so we're seeing a lot of folks actually leveraging what we're um, a, a data where, data marks on top of the data lake. And, and Roshan, I hope this kind of answers your question. But um, you know, one of the things that, that Amazon, the AWS talks a lot about is building kind of your line of business or your data marks on top of the data lake. And an architecture that, that a lot of enterprises are moving to are basically setting up um, line of business data marts on a data lake so that each line of business has full access to all of their data. So that means that, for an example, you know, the marketing team has their marketing analyst, has their marketing ops, has their marketing engineer, um, all, all having access to one specific data mart on the company's data lake. And HR might have a, have a tool or a data mart. I mean, so, so we're seeing this, uh, this idea of kind of a, uh, a mesh on top of the data lake a lot more. And so I think in that way, you, it's a little bit of a, of a star schema in that the data lake um, is kind of the, the central repository and then you can set up your data marts on top of it. So it does kind of create a, a, a star schema in that sense. And there's some really great articles that um, AWS has written on that, uh, Roshan. So I highly recommend checking those out. I love it. So it um, seems like a data lake is more of an ODS, but has a cleaner data. Is this a fair assessment? Um, so when I think of, uh, of ODS, yeah, I, I guess so. I, I, I think it kind of depends on, uh, on the use case, right? And so, 
um, you know, a lot of a lot of companies are very organized in their data lake approach, and they have their their cat their metadata catalogs, and they have their their data catalogs sitting right on top, and that does help it uh, become much more organized and clean. Um, but keep in mind, a data lake is a repository for any and all types of data, so you can have your um, you know, your files in there, um, you can have your, your photos in there, your videos in there, and then that, that's the beauty of the data lake and specifically with the open data lake house is that you can run, you know, your SQL workloads on top, but you can also run your AI and your ML workloads on top. And so that's, that's one of the really powerful characteristics of the open data lake house is that you can run various types of workloads, workloads that you can't necessarily run on the data warehouse. And that is why we're seeing a big shift to this data lake house approach. Molly, are there tools to build a lake house available in the on-prem world? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, you know, I showed, let me see if I can find this architecture again. I showed our view because we are a native, we are uh, fully in cloud. Um, here it is. Um, but you can run, you can build a lake house on your own. I mean, th that's the beauty of, of the open data lake house is that each one of these components is, is self-managed, right? And so instead of a cloud data lake, you could do an on-prem Hadoop. Uh, you could run Presto on top of that. You could run your ML and AI on top of that. You could set up your own governance and, and security. So absolutely, I think it would be more of a do-it-yourself approach, but it, it's certainly possible. So how does Presto uh, leverage existing identity and access management infrastructures? Yeah, so, um, so there's um, a few different uh, things. So let me talk about it from, a, from an Ahana perspective. So one is we actually just announced um, um, uh, a, a lot of security um, updates um, and enhancements from an Ahana for Presto perspective. Uh, specifically, we now have uh, integration with AWS Lake Formation. If you're not familiar, AWS Lake Formation is an obviously AWS service that provides the identity and access management. Um, it helps you build a secure data lake in literally hours. Um, and so through that integration, you can do a lot of very fine grained uh, data access privacy control. Additionally, we also integrate with Apache Ranger, which is an open source security tool also giving you um, identity and access management, uh, very fine grained permissions, et cetera. So there are a few different routes you can take depending on, on what you wanna do. And that's from a Nahana perspective, of course, from a Presto open source perspective, you can roll your own, right? So Presto integrates with Apache uh, Ranger. Um, and so you have the ability to do that as well from an open source perspective. So are you um, multi-cloud or just AWS? Yeah, good question. So from an Ahana perspective, we are today just in AWS, uh, just available in AWS. Um, however, Presto, the open source project is available in all clouds or on-prem. Uh, so you can run Presto, do it yourself, wherever you want. Is uh, Ahana Cloud FedRAMP certified? I feel like we get this question quite a bit, so I need to bring it back to my product team. <laughs> uh, we're not FedRAMP certified, um, but because we get this quite a bit, I think it's something we need to look into. Definitely worth it. So yeah, um, besides cost consideration, when do you recommend using Presto S3 yeah. versus- um, Redshift. Yeah. Um, well, and you know, we've got a couple of com we've got a couple of um, a comparison. And, and though we are a vendor neutral company, you know, really, what's when should you use yeah. Presto? Um, sure. Yeah, and I think this kind of goes back to some of the use cases I was describing. And so, for those who don't know, Redshift is Amazon's cloud uh, data warehouse. Um, and so, I think it's. Uh, besides the cost consideration, you know, what kinds of workloads, and I talked about this earlier, you know, future proofing yourself, what are the use cases that you're going to need to run? What are the kinds of workloads that you're going to need to run? Not today, not just today, but in the future, right? And so, yeah, I talked a lot about price performance and that's where we see, um, you know, immediate, we will see immediate results, but down the road, you know, are you going to be needing to do AI and ML? 
um, at any given point in time. And, and I think, you know, having the flexibility to do that is something to really consider, um, you know, not to mention open data formats, right? The ability to run various compute engines on top of your data. Those are the kinds of things to think about if you're, if you're looking at, you know, a, a data lake house approach versus a, a data warehouse approach. And specifically here with, you know, Ernesto asks about Presto and S3 and Redshift. You know, that's what I talked about because I live in the Presto world, but there's other technologies that, you know, other data warehouse technologies out there and other data lake house technologies out there that are going to kind of solve for the same sorts of problems. Um, but uh, but Redshift to, to Presto S3 is certainly one that we see quite a bit. Awesome. Thank you. So um, why is Presto performance on Ahana Cloud three times faster than Presto yep. on AWS? I love that question, Carmen. <laughs> so, um, so we have, uh, we've built some proprietary features in Ahana, one of which is what we call data lake caching. So we actually have a cache built in uh, directly into Ohana that is giving you that, that performance boost. So that's not available in the open source Presto project today. Um, so that's typically why we see um, Ohana Cloud for Presto faster, um, Presto on AWS. And then of course, not to mention all the other benefits you get from a managed service, right? So, um, you know, resource, uh, engineering resource overhead, managing, managing and deploying and tuning Presto. I mean, I think there's literally like a thousand different configuration parameters um, that, that you can, that you can uh, throttle back and forth with on Presto, which is a lot. And so we've kind of abstracted away all those complexities and made it very easy to, to get Presto up and running in the cloud. And literally like in 30 minutes, you're up and running. Oh, that's impressive. So, it sounds like you're using uh, virtual star schemas and that people aren't necessarily materializing them. What are you, you they using to do the virtualize, virtual, virtualizing? Does Presto allow us to define schemas and present these to reporting tools? Yeah, so um, Richard, I, I think, uh, let me try to answer your question. So I think, um, you know, typically what we see is, is Presto running on top of the data lake and then and I don't have it in this slide. So, but uh, but your metadata catalog and your data catalog, those are going to be important components to um, to organizing your data, uh, materializing it, being able to um, you know use that as as the crawler, I guess, in some sense of your data. And then uh, I'm not sure exactly. Virtualizing is kind of an overloaded term, so I'll take a guess. By virtualizing, you mean um, uh, being able to, I, I think, identify where your data is sitting and in, in underneath the, the data lake. I'm not sure. But anyways, um, uh, with Presto, so you'd actually be using the, uh, an attached catalog to define schemas. And then from there, that's right, your reporting and dashboarding would use that to actually pull that in, in, into the report and dashboard. I love it. So many great questions coming in and following up on that, you know, most enterprises use Active Directory, maybe, maybe uh, uh, Okta for identity and access management. AWS is separate, is a separate world isolated in that respect. Can we integrate with Active Directories? Yeah, uh, uh, I think you can with, with open source uh, Presto. So you, um, you it, there's uh, if you go to the docs, there's a, I think a whole thing on Active Directory and LDAP authentication. So check that out and that will give you more detail. What was that URL again? Uh, just go to the Presto docs, prestodb.io, it's the open source project. And in the docs, you'll, you'll be able to see more about Active Directory. Perfect. Um, and what do you use for metadata management? Yeah, so um, from an Ahana perspective, uh, we uh, Ahana comes pre-bundled with an Ahana managed hive metastore. Um, so that is part of your part of the product itself and that's all um, self-managed and and comes pre-bundled. Um, so hive and then glue is the other one that you can also integrate with from an ADA, from an Amazon perspective. Some great questions coming in here. Um, so when is the perfect moment to move from data warehouse to a data lake, taking into consideration the amount of data and the amount of sessions connected uh, X time in my 
infrastructure? And what do I need to measure in terms to take the decision? Yeah, it's a good question. So what we see um, in our kind of customer base is, is when those costs start escalating. Um, and so if you, you know, as, as you scale your business, as your data starts growing, as your compute resources, resource needs start growing, that's when you're going to start seeing some, some price jumps. Um, and that's the, and that's from our perspective, what we're seeing is the big, biggest pain for our customers is all of a sudden, you know, they're paying, you know, 10 X more in some cases, um, every month, um, because, because of the compute. Um, and so when you start seeing that pain, that's a good time. Um, you know, obviously before that is even better when you don't have to pay it, but if you, if you have a, you know, an expectation that your, your business is going to grow, your data is going to grow and your compute needs are going to grow. That's when you start, should start exploring the, the data lake. And, and, and not to mention, you know, we, we talk to a lot of folks that are kind of in that, um, in their journey of moving from a data warehouse to a data lake because they have hit those pains or they're even before the data warehouse, they're pre data warehouse and they're trying to figure out should I choose a data warehouse or a data lake? And our take is the data lake is going to give you much more flexibility, much more, um, you know, openness um, and, and help you future proof your use cases. And, and um, you know, our belief is that 80% of the data is going to be in the data lake. So take advantage of the data lake, build that data lake house in the right way so that you're set for today and you're set for the future. Perfect. And so in the fabric versus mesh debate, which we used to talk about as data federation, where yeah. do you place Presto? Yeah, so um, it's funny. So the fabric versus mesh debate, I think there's kind of, I think these terms all get conflated. You have data fabric, you have data mesh, you have data virtualization, right? And so Presto is, is powerful in that you can query data where it lives. And so Presto sits kind of on top of on top of your data sources. And that's kind of the beauty about Presto is you don't need to move data. You don't need to ETL your data, um, copy your data, et cetera, right? You can, you can query your data where it lives. Now that said, our perspective at Ahana is that, like I just mentioned, we think like up to 80% of data is going to live in the data lake. And so if that's the case, and if that's where your primary workloads and use cases are going to run, then Presto just on top of S3 is gonna take care of about 80% of, of workloads. Um, and that's what we're building. We're building the best engine for the data lake, for the data lake house. And so it's, for us, it's less about fabric and mesh and accessing a bunch of different um, data sources and more about building the best performing, um, you know, best SQL engine on the market for the data lake. So, um, a lot of questions on schema, you know, schema changes and, and data updates are always incredibly painful. Does Presto yeah. make this easier? So, um, so when we talk about the data lake house, Presto works very well with, um, with technologies like Apache Hoodie and Delta Lake and Iceberg and those, and it's that layer that would um, typically be kind of handling the, the inserts, the upserts, the, the updating. Um, and so uh, from that perspective, Presto plus Apache Hoodie, for example, on top of S3 is, is, um, is how we are recommending to our customers to, to do that in the right way. I love it. So um, I'll give everyone a couple more minutes to put questions in the Q and A. But um, in the meantime, you know, is Presto ASIC compliant? Um, so from uh, oh, I see it because we're in the chat now. <laughs> um, so from an ACID compliant perspective, you can uh, you can use ACID tables um, in Presto. Um, and, and this goes back to what I was just talking about with. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, so at, at a high level, um, you can support it. It is supported. 
Um, but there are some nuances there. And I, and I am not an expert in that, so I won't go into detail, but I recommend checking out the Presto um, uh, documentation. And can you speak to data, your data quality approach? Um, I'm not exactly sure what that question means. Katie, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more. I'll give Katie a moment to, to elaborate there. Um, uh, in the meantime, can you operate against Delta Lake? And, or, yes. So, okay. um, so Richard, actually next week, there is a really great um, virtual event happening uh, where the Del uh, um, Denny from the Delta Lake community will be talking about, we just, the Presto open source community just announced an integration Presto plus Delta Lake. Um, so he'll be diving more into the architecture on that. And, and there are integrations with both Presto Hoodie and Presto and Delta Lake. And so, yes, the answer is yes, you can. And check out the meetup next week, next Tuesday. <laughs> it does sound yummy. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> great. <laughs> so back to Katie's question, you know, on data quality, yeah. uh, tools for using data quality, data cleansing, governance. Sure. So uh, from an Ahana perspective, we talk a lot about Lake, AWS Lake Formation, which gives you governance on your data lake. Uh, if you are an AWS user, I highly re recommend checking out Lake Formation. It's, it's um, an easy service that gets you up and running on building a secure data lake um, on S3. And then Ahana for Presto integrates very seamlessly with AWS Lake Formation. Open source, uh, like I mentioned earlier, Apache Ranger is good for, for security and governance. Um, so there are a few tools that are pretty baked in that that um, that you can use, and then you can also roll your own as long as you can connect, um, you know, JDBC, ODBC, or or on top of your data lake, you should be able to use it with Presto. I love it. Well, that's all the questions we have, Ali. Thank you so much for this great presentation, and thanks to Hana for sponsoring today's uh, webinar and. Um, and again, just a reminder to everybody, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, links to the recording, and the additional links here that we've posted um, throughout the webinar and to y'all. So again, thank you all for a great uh, and joining us today. And Allie, thank you so much. Hope you all have a great day. Thank you.